Good morning, New City. Let's try that again. Good morning, New City. I like it. Let's stand and hear our call to worship. This is from Exodus. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? And let's read this next part together. Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. These words from Moses call us to remember the majesty and the holiness of God. Who is like him? No one. He's perfect. He is good. He is righteous. He's unlike anyone else. In creating this world, God has done glorious deeds. So let's sing together this morning to our holy God of all the glorious things that he has done for us. the word 
we just sang about God's perfect holiness. And because of that, God can require nothing less than perfection from us. We look at this world, we look at ourselves, and it's pretty clear we fall short of that standard. Because of sin, we are unable to live up to God's perfect expectations, no matter how hard we try, how much we give, how good we think we are. The psalmist reminds us that God has not left us or forgotten us, though. Psalm 40 says this, But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. Read this with me. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Even in our brokenness and our imperfections, he still takes thought for us. He continues to care for us. He hears our cries, and he sees that we need a Savior. So continue confessing our need for a Savior with me. Let's pray. Holy Father, we come before you now, each one of us knowing the sins and failures we've committed and experienced, and there's even more that we may not realize. Try as we might, we never could and never will get it right. Our sin, our pride, our selfishness and grip of control are all obstacles that separate us from you. But instead of leaving us alone and unable to live up to your perfect standard, you patiently call us to come to you, to come and confess and believe and trust in you. Forgive us, Father. Save us from ourselves and our misbeliefs.
God, hearing our cries for help, provided a way out, a way out of the bondage and slavery to sin, and he provided a way for all our needs in his son, Jesus Christ, living the perfect, holy life on earth we couldn't, and he died the death that we so rightly deserve and rose from the grave, defeating death and sin once and for all. How good is that news? He fulfills and satisfies our wandering and longing hearts. In Titus, we read this, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Let's read this next part together. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Isn't that good news? Right? We gather Sunday mornings to remember and to celebrate that good news. And one of the ways we celebrate is by singing. So, Will you sing loudly this next song? Maybe 10 of you will. I want the whole room to be singing loudly because this is good news. We are celebrating. So will you sing loudly? Yes. the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living God. Who could Yeah. 
Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on Came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, your Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the salvation you provided through your son. You didn't give us what we deserve. Instead, you gifted us with living hope. Through the gift of Jesus, you lavished your great love, your mercy and grace upon us. You set us free from a life in sin, separated from you completely. Thank you for that good news. Continue to speak the truth into us. Continue to speak the gospel into our lives. Make it change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we move into our greeting time, welcome one another as Christ lovingly welcomed us into his family. All right, New City, welcome. You guys can have a seat. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to New City. Um, I'm Joey Olivier, Director of Operations here. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, if, you, uh, if you're visiting with us, we're very glad you're here, and um, we'd love for you to stop by the Connect Bar, uh, get to know more about us, and uh, we hope you're welcomed well, and if you'll fill out a Connect card and let us know how we can pray for you, we have a, a gift for you for visiting with us. Uh, so thank you for being here. 
A um, couple of things in the bulletin that I wanted to point out to you guys. Hope everybody got one of these. Uh, there is a an opportunity for um, many many photo sessions coming up May 21st. It's going to be at the new uh, property, the new building that we're purchasing. Um, so out there, we have uh, Candace Emerson and Asha Smith are going to use their artistic talents, and they're going to photograph um, individuals, couples, families, however you want to do it. Uh, it's a fundraiser for it to help with our new building. So go to our website. You can find a link, and you can get uh, signed up for one of those mini sessions on May 21st. And another thing I wanted to point out is that in May, there are five Sundays, and every uh, five Sunday month, we we link up with one of our missional partners and dedicate our fifth Sunday giving. This month, it is Young Life. Um, Young Life is a great organization. We have a number of folks here at New City who are actively involved. Uh, they do great things in the community for our youth. And so, um, linked to that, if you enjoy the music of our New City Band, um, they are going to be performing at Society Garden May 18th. That's a Wednesday evening uh, to raise money for Young Life. So that's a fundraiser uh, to support Young Life, that uh, organization that we love. So uh, that's all I want to highlight from here. And uh, we have a guest preacher this morning, a guest speaker, Dan Darden. He is a director of Christian Counseling Services here in Macon. He's a, a gifted counselor and, and speaker, and he's a brother in Christ. And so we're, we're thankful to have him here with us. Uh, so let's, um, let's pray together, and then we'll get started. Father God, thank you for uh, this morning as we come together to celebrate um, how you have adopted us into, into your family, to celebrate and praise uh, the one who sets us free, as we sang, the, our living hope in Christ. And uh, thank you for, uh, for Dan's willingness to, to help us to press into your word this morning, to, um, to learn from it and to grow in it, to grow in you. I pray that your spirit will guide us, that you will open our ears and hearts, uh, that we will understand God as you ordain, uh, and I just ask you to bless our brother as he speaks this morning. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Isn't that a good word? We're not going to be talking about that this morning, but that's a good scripture, isn't it? Do you, do you realize God has gifted you with every single solitary thing you need for life and godliness? And that sets you free from the burden of having to worry about getting something that you've persuaded that you need when in fact you've already been granted it. And that's a wonderful freedom that we have. So uh, the gospel is the power of God into salvation, right? And that's a blessed word. Turn in your Bible, if you will, to Luke chapter 6. This morning we're going to be taking a look at verses uh, 12 through 19 in chapter 6. I understand Keith got it started last week. And um, we're going to take a look at that. So let me, let me read it uh, to you this morning. In these days, he, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from Judah and Jerusalem and the surrounding area of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. So here we have, if you will, a, a, a little uh, story of a day in the life of Jesus that's got some rather amazing things as he seeks to build his team that will carry forth the gospel 
upon his departure, which at this point in time, he's not discussed with them. Well, let's see what has taken place. Luke, as you know, was uh, the only Gentile writer in the New Testament accounts. He was uh, by trade a physician, traveled with the Apostle Paul, which during the canonization of Scripture gave him credibility uh, for, to be, for his letters to be included. He wrote Luke, and as you well know, he wrote the book of Acts. Uh, but he, he writes in a very organized manner. As a matter of fact, he's writing to a man named Theophilus. And he's writing to give him account of all of the things that he had heard through the witnesses of the gospel. And he's putting together that account. And he says he's doing it in an orderly fashion. It's a narrative that he wants his friend to know. Now, um, so interestingly enough, the one for whom the letter was intended was one person. Isn't that interesting? And so when we read it, we're sort of reading somebody else's mail, aren't we? You know, and aren't you glad? That's, that's kind of interesting. But he writes in a, in a very sequenced, orderly fashion. And up until this point, here's, what, here's where he has carried us up to uh, chapter 6. Uh, the foretelling of the birth of John the Baptist. The foretelling of Jesus' birth. The Magnificat of Mary. John the Baptist's birth, Zechariah's prophecy, which was a unique prophecy because he had an interesting experience in not believing the angel Gabriel. And what happened? Well, he lost his voice, right? Um, very, very interesting uh, consequence of that. He regained his voice after the birth of the son. Of the son. We see... Um, the birth of Christ, his presentation in the temple, Simeon's declaration. Simeon was the one who had so longed in his heart to see the coming of the Messiah. And uh, the Holy Spirit confirms with him that this, in fact, is the one. And he also introduces something most interesting in what he says, and that is Gentiles. So that's kind of nice because we're included, right? And, and that what's going to be coming. We see Jesus' teaching in the temple at 12 years old. We see John's preaching and the baptism of Jesus as call to repentance and the baptism, baptism of Jesus. We see the genealogy of Jesus. Now, why is that significant? Why would anybody include someone's genealogy? Well, because guess what it's got in it? Folks from your and my like, it's got some Gentiles in there. And that's that's kind of nice, right? Particularly when you look at the character of those in the genealogy. That's even most interesting, right? And that's nice to know because uh, the gospel is all inclusive. We see um, the temptation of Jesus. Why is that significant? Because Hebrews tells us that we have a great high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses in that he was tempted in all ways as we have been tempted, yet without sin. So when you look at his temptations in the desert, you could take those, really those three uh, specific ones and break them down into little ones and how they, shall we say, tease out in life so that the writer of Hebrews could in fact say that Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. So that makes him closer than a brother, Hebrews tells us, because he's experienced that. You and I do not walk a path that Christ has not yet walked. And that's a tremendous encouragement to us. We see his ensuing ministry and teaching in the synagogues. We see his healing of that uh, of, of the man with the unclean spirit on the Sabbath. And that's in Luke, that's kind of the first biggie he pulls off when he does that. And it happens to be on the Sabbath. Well, already he's starting to create a little friction, isn't he? His declaration of preaching, the good news of the kingdom. And that's good news. If you ever leave church worse than when you came, guess what you didn't hear? You didn't hear good news. You heard some news that included what you had to go do. Instead of the blessed gift of getting to do what you want to do because of who you are in Christ. We get to participate. It's a blessed gift that we have. 
We see the call of His first disciples. That's the little boat experience right there. They're not having very much success in the old uh, fishing category. We see the, cleaning, uh, the cleansing of a leper. Well, what do you think that indicates? Christ loves all. The unclean. The, the touching in, of the leper. We see healing of the uh, paralytic. And what does he do there? Boy, he's now he's really turning up the heat. He forgives sins. Whew. Well, that prompted the Pharisees and the scribes, right? To, boy, oh, this guy's blaspheming. But it later says in that little piece there in, in five, that, uh, chapter 5 that, he, uh, that they were filled with amazement at what he was doing. We see the call of Levi. Did anybody watch The Chosen? It's a delightful series. I don't know about you, but you just can really, boy, you can just link with Christ, right? I mean, it's just his personality, and that's just awesome. And, of course, Levi Matthew, right? So I think he's, what, on the high autistic scale? And, you know, for some, that might be awesome and kind of thing. But now, uh, there, uh, there perhaps are some liberties taking there. But, but anyway, it's the most interesting uh, relationship that Jesus has, and I love Jesus' word plays with them and things like that, which is really kind of nice. Uh, we see the, the, uh, at the end of 5, chapter 5, the new wineskins required for new wine. See, Jesus is getting ready to introduce something. You can't put new and old. That just won't work. For whatever system it is, it has to be all new, Right? We see his declaration as Lord of the Sabbath after their response to his boys not fasting, you know. And we see uh, the healing of the man with the withered hand on the synagogue on the Sabbath. And you, I think Keith probably touched on that last week when he was talking about that. So this brings us to our passage today in which Jesus chooses his apostles who would be responsible for explicating the blessings of the new covenant following the advent of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. You, you understand, right, that his disciples fundamentally were kind of clueless until the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of interesting. You know, they're just, you know, they're just sort of walking along kind of in a, you know, daze on some level. But they came to grasp all that he was only because of the Spirit's capacity to open ears and open eyes, which is what he has to do with us, right? Which gives us that full clarity on the deity of Christ and who he is and what he's come to do. Now, before I focus on, on our passage today, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'd like to introduce a little review of last week uh, in, in Luke uh, 6. Um, uh, 6 through 11, and here's why I want to do it. I, I want to put on my counseling cap a minute because this passage I want to look at is one that I use very frequently in counseling because I want to encourage you. I know it's not our passage under study this morning, but I want you to see a wonderful takeaway from it that is especially encouraging to all of us, particularly those of you that are parents. Okay, so let me read it. Take a look, beginning in verse 6. It says, On another Sabbath, he, Jesus, entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. Now, up to this point, he's already done that. He's getting ready to hammer it home again. But he knew their thoughts. And by the way, he's the only one that does. You don't know somebody's thoughts, even though you might think you do, right? We, we know what somebody's thinking, right? Oh, well, you really don't. But Jesus does, however. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. And the man rose and stood there. And Jesus said to the Pharisees and scribes, or all of those around, I, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them all, Jesus said to the man with a withered hand, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they, i.e. the Pharisees and the scribes, were filled with fury and discussed with another what they might do to Jesus. Now, here's what I want you to see. 
how do you reconcile an incredibly blessed act for someone with a withered hand? We don't know how, how, how long he's had it. We just know it was a restored. Right? And respond with fury and discussion of what to do about Jesus who therefore healed him. Well, here's, here's the principle that I use in counseling what I want you to see. All right? It is not the facts of life, even if it's Jesus healing someone, that we respond to. It's our interpretation of them. It's not the facts of life that we respond to. It's our interpretation of them. That produces our response. And when I share that principle with people, this is the biblical example that I use to demonstrate the power of that. Right? So here's Jesus. He's healing. So how, do you, how do you suppose he felt? I would suspect he's rejoicing, full of delight and joy. And yet, here are Pharisees and scribes filled with fury. Now, that's a powerful word. That's kind of a step or two above anger. And to the point they discussed doing away with him. So we see something happening. We see a response to that which is happening. But what we don't have in the narrative is what they were thinking or telling themselves about what just happened. And I'm not much of a speculator, but I bet we could put in the fill in the blanks, don't you? What they might have been thinking. How dare him? He's stealing our authority. What are we going to do about him? Right? right? Now, here's what I want you to see. Okay? You, my dear beloved, can be Jesus to someone. And they can hate you and be angry with you. You can do everything perfectly in your life. And others be disgusted with you. Because it's not what you're doing. It's the story and the narrative they bring to themselves about what you're doing that creates the response in life. Very important. Now, parents, hear me very carefully. This is for your encouragement. You could parent your children perfectly. Perfectly. Do everything precisely right, and that does not guarantee your desired outcome for them. Jesus taught his disciples perfectly for three years, some three and a half, right in there. And when he needed them the most, and I'll bet his first thought wasn't, what did I leave out? What did I forget to teach them? He taught them perfectly. So be encouraged, my dear friends, parents. By all means, be diligent. Teach them the gospel. Teach them the core values that stem from the gospel. But let not your heart be particularly troubled as if, in fact, you left out something when their choices as children, younger children, adolescents, or young adults are not as you have taught them. Because, as I said, you could do it perfectly. Right? So keep responsibility where it belongs. Now I'll take off my counselor hat. Right? Be encouraged by that. And let's take a look at our narrative. Okay. And before I get into the narrative, let, let, me, let me share some additional thoughts that's important for us when we come to reading Scripture and interpreting Scripture. Right? These, these are what we would call interpretative tools or principles. The fancy word is hermeneutics. When I, was taught, I taught my church that one time, they said, Herman who? I went, what? But it's the, it's the skill of going back to the then and there and understanding it in the here and now. And it's very crucial. All right? Genre in Scripture is, is very important. So we have parables. We have stories. We have psalms. Right? We have parables. We have these wonderful ways of expressing. And... Um, this particular passage we're looking at this morning, it's short, but it's a narrative. It's a, what we would call a historical narrative. And here's why, this is, why I want to share this with you. It's important. 
we have to use cautions when we read narratives about precisely how far we're going to press it to squeeze out doctrine. Because narrative is primarily descriptive, not prescriptive. Right? Now, that's not to say absolutely that we can't derive doctrine from narrative because we can. But we have to be very careful. Narrative is descriptive, not prescriptive. It's informative, not directive. So our narrative this morning, we will learn some things. It will tell us some things in the, in the day and the life of Christ. Right? But we have to be careful that we don't start pressing it to the point that we've just got to get doctrine out of it. All right? Because it's not designed for that. We will learn some things. We, I think we will. All right? But that's the, if we're not careful, a narrative can be fraught with opportunities to establish poor doctrine and set precedents for future practice. Reading the book of Acts, there's a lot of precedence that takes place, but it's describing something that's take, that took place, but it's not intended to therefore be always from that point. Because if you conclude that, then you're going to be really confused about what necessarily establishes sound doctrine. So that's the first sort of aside I want you to know before we look at it. The second thing of equal importance is this. Jesus had two messages. He had two ministries. Right? His first ministry or his first message was to bring his Jewish audience under the futility of their own law-keeping efforts. What would make you run to Jesus? You've got to cut your self-righteous legs out from underneath yourself. You've got, to en you've got to enhance what the law says to the degree that you feel smothered. And his audience was primarily Jewish. If you don't understand that, how many had a red letter Bible growing up? Okay. Not everything in red applies to you. It might be for you, but it's not to you. We learned from it. But a lot of what Jesus said was specific. He was the greatest law preacher who ever lived. You find that on the Sermon on the Mount, and you find that on the Sermon on the, what we would call the Sermon on the Plain, kind of a derivative. Christ is elevating it so high that then when he says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, that's like the final coup d'etat, right? That's like, boy, the final blow. What do I do with that? Uh, you run from it to somebody who's your refuge and who is, in fact, going to implement the new covenant in which you have all of the the blessed benefactor of all of his blessings. Right? So you see things in the Sermon on the Mount and uh, the Sermon on the Plain, and you go, wow, forgive as we uh, 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 forgive so that we can be forgiven? Uh, do you pray that? Oh, Lord, forgive me today as I've forgiven others. Not me. I say, Lord, remind me today how greatly I've been forgiven so that I have the wherewithal to forgive those who offend me. Because that's the new covenant, you see. And all these unique things. The second message of Jesus. We like this one. It's a sneak preview. It's a sneak preview of what's to come. Right? So he's putting in these little t snippets of what's going to be coming. Right? When he leaves and the comforter comes and his, his, his apostles, you know, how do we know what... He says, I, I will teach you all truth. I will lead you in all truth. Well, how do we know what it is? Well, you, you find them in the epistles. Uh, that's the church's constitution. But he does things like um, uh, the new wine, for example. You can't put new wine in an old wineskin. It doesn't fit. You've got to have a new one. So the old has to go, abolish, boom, sh Hebrews, right? Gone, right? Uh, the parable of the prodigal son really should be probably, probably prodigal father. It's really a parable about the father. We see that. Oh, well, that, that'll turn heads. What do you mean the, the older brother who did everything he's supposed to do? And, uh, you know. There's a little sneak preview, right? 
um, the parable of the vineyard workers. Well, buddy, when you read that, what happens in you? What do you mean? I'm, I was there since 6 o'clock. And you're paying the guy that got there an hour, and he was probably drunk when he got there, and you're paying him the same thing I got. It was just a, you know, that's not fair precisely. You may have lived a life of incredible excellence, but your reward is the same as the thief on the cross. Your reward is Jesus. Heaven's not, not our reward. Our, it's just where our reward lives. One Puritan once said, if should I get to heaven and Jesus not be there, I would leave immediately. Heaven's about Christ. He's our crown of life. He's our reward. He's our inheritance. Okay? And then there's the uh, woman caught in adultery. Well, we got a bunch of rock throwers, and then all of a sudden a mercy shower shows up. You know, we like to be rock throwers, and Jesus is a mercy shower, a grace shower. And we see this incredible dynamic. Well, that's a little sneak preview of what's coming. He doesn't say go and sin no more or else. He just says, go and sin no more. Why, you don't have to do that anymore. Right? Okay. So, that's, that's important for us to understand. Right? It's historical narrative. We have to be careful what we take from it. And we have to remember the message of Jesus because the Sermon on the Plain is next week probably. It follows this particular section today. So, you're going to see things in there. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Yeah, so what if I, somebody offends me and I don't forgive them and I die in a plague crash? Well, I'm sorry, but you got some problems, right? So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Which, which mode is he in? Is he a good cop or bad cop? Right? What, what is he doing? All right, now let's just take a look at our text. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. So what do we learn? Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed. He's not telling us to pray. The writer's not telling us to pray. The writer is certainly not telling us to pray all night. So, for example, were we to squeeze that, see, we might conclude, well, you know, Luke says Jesus went to the mountain and prayed all night, therefore we need to pray all night. Well, you beloved, if you want to, that's perfectly fine. I'm kind of like the disciples. I don't think I could hang, right? That's a tough thing. But we learned Jesus prayed. What does it mean? He loved his father. He talked to him. Um, I'm almost 69 years old, and I've been a Christian since I was 15, so I don't know how many years that is, but I, I don't think I got prayer down yet. Do you? Have you got it figured all out? I, I don't. But I do know this. It is sort of more about talking to God all the time. It's, it's a pretty nice person to have to just talk to. Right? And we see other places where Christ prayed, you know, John 17, the high priestly prayer, Garden of Gethsemane. So we know it's important. But we don't want to say much more than that. We just want to say, Luke says, Jesus went to the mountain and he prayed all night. Okay? So Jesus prayed. It's not being prescribed it's being described. All right, secondly, look at the next verses, 13 through 16. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12, whom he named apostles. Now, why did he choose 12? I don't know. And you don't either. You know why? It doesn't tell us. Now, some may say, well, 12 tribes of Israel. Well, you got a problem. There were 13. Right? Because Joseph's two grandsons, so take out Joseph and put in Manasseh and Ephraim. So there's 13. What do you do with that? Well, you might say, well, they got rid of one, you know, one died and they added another one. Well, Apostle Paul was the 13th. But the reality is, we don't know. Here's what we know. He chose 12. Right? And we know that all apostles are disciples, but not all disciples are apostles. Even the apostle Paul was disciple three years. 
before getting the apostleship. And we also learn it's not a self-declarative title. See, these, you know, apostle this and apostle that. And pardon me, but, you know, in a sense, we're all apostles. It's used over 80 times in the New Testament, most of which is the one sent or sent to send someone. But here we see it's very specific and unique as Jesus is building this team. Ephesians 2.20 says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Prophets there, by the way, are probably New Testament prophets. But either way, the apostles are the foundation. Right? But he chose 12. Well, why did he choose Judas Iscariot knowing that he was going to betray him? I don't know and you don't either. Because it doesn't tell us why. But he did choose Judas. He chose Judas. And as we know, who would later betray him. And then, of course... Later on, right, in, in Acts, right there, pretty, pretty early in Acts, he choose, they choose Matthias. So two guys come up, right? You know how they chose him? Right? Casting lots. Any elders in here? Is that how they chose you? you know? <laughs> well, just cast some lots. Some of them probably went, boy, oh, that was good. Man, that's awesome. Right, But the, that wouldn't set a precedent, right, that that's how you choose elders. Well, you know, I cast lots for, you know, Matthias. We don't know why he chose Judas, but we know he did, and we know his story. All right, lastly, 17 through 19. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. Now, all doesn't always mean all, as some would necessarily say, but I think in the context here, it means all. So what do we learn? Well, we learn that Jesus can heal. We learn as he establishes his authority with the capacity over illness and disease. The capacity to forgive sins. Uh, he's, he's taking on a very unique personality. Right? As, he, as he's sort of setting up his unique kingdom, which we learn later on as he tells Peter, it's not of this world. And it's not. It's of you. It's an internal kingdom with the reality of it manifested in our ambassadorship and the proclamation of it. But, but the beloved kingdom that we will experience on earth is yet to come. Right? So we know unclean spirits, he cured them. And he healed them. Well, well, can we take that and impress it and say, well, Jesus always heals? I think not because, beloved, that, that becomes an incredible burden that people bear because inevitably it falls back on you. The reason that you're not healed is because of your lack of faith. It's the cruelest theology on the planet. And quite honestly, it's really not even scriptural if you tease it out enough. Be very careful with that. You may have been healed, whether directly or through doctors, and thank God, and we praise God that he can do whatever he wants to do. He can heal directly or through doctors or, or things like that. But we can't take this and say, that's going to happen all the time. Because probably mostly it doesn't. He's with us in our suffering, in our afflictions. But we have to be very careful of what we conclude either about God or about ourselves, if in fact that healing doesn't take place. By his stripes we are healed, but the healing that takes place there is a spiritual one and an eternal one, right? And we're thankful for that. So, as we summarize, right, we have a unique text, and we just we learned from it. And the things we learned, right, Jesus prayed, 
So it must be really important. So we get to talk with our Heavenly Father because His Son talked to Him. Right? We know that Jesus chose 12 apostles. Why 12? We don't know. But He, know, he knew for, what, for whatever reason, out of all of the disciples, He chose 12. He chose one who would be a, bet- a betrayer, whom He knew would. But He chose him anyway. And that, that story played itself out in the, in the providential way that God intended. We know that he heals. And in this narrative, we see him healing multitude, a lot, all that came. And that he has the capacity to do that. So we don't, we never surrender the idea that he can't. But we're confident in him whether he does or not. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the fact that uh, you talk to us and you talk to us in your word. You were gracious and kind enough to give it to us so that we wouldn't be adrift on a sea without a compass, that we would learn about you, that we would learn about us, that we would learn about this, this chasm created by an incredible poor choice. And yet we feel the weight of that choice as if, in fact, we had made it. We read about your redemption, which kicks off in Genesis 3 as the promise that the the son would crush the head of the serpent. And we, we long for and yearn for and look forward to consummation, the return of Christ, the, 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 the eternal bliss of the saints' resting place. We long for that. It encourages us. It helps us in times of difficulty and suffering. As the Apostle Paul said, we are to set our minds on things above, not on things below. Thank you for your word. Thank you, for, thank you that you abide in us for all the blessings that you've given us in Christ. Bless everyone here. May they know more, day, more and more daily the glory of Christ, that their hearts may be may be tuned into that because that is what moves us forward. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, we're now going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's a wonderful time for you not to examine yourself. It's not about you. You're a benefactor. It's about the one with whom we were just speaking. It's about the new covenant. Because it's the blood of the new covenant. The cup is the blood of the new covenant. And when did the new covenant start? After his death. Matthew 1 1 is not the New Testament. Right? It's after his death. Well, what are those bless what are the blessings? Oh my. I will cause you to walk in my ways. I will take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you. I will forgive all of your sins. Not only that, I won't even remember them. When you bring your sins up to God, there's crickets, you know, because he doesn't remember them. Full forgiveness, adoption as his child, blessed with the presence of the Holy Spirit. You're in Christ, he is in you. You're already seated in heavenly places with all of the spiritual blessings in Christ. He gives you everything pertaining to life and godliness so that you may abound in every good work. That's the new covenant, fully forgiven by all that he's done. A child of God, a child of righteousness. If you die today, you're perfectly fit for heaven. That's the new covenant. And when we ponder those things, our hearts, as the folks on the road to Emmaus said, our hearts burn within us. So, my understanding, come and take the bread. You can dip it in the wine or you can take the bread and... Take a cup of wine with you. Juice. Okay. All right. All right. So you may begin. Would you stand with us?
gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. 
In Jesus, God gave us everything we could ever possibly need. Although life on earth is hard, and I think we can all agree on that. It is hard, but he gave us the Holy Spirit. For those who trust in him, we have the exact same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave. And let's continue now, joyfully singing and praising our God who provides for us even into eternity. The promised seed of God, Jesus died for you. In taking the blame, he buried our shame. Though sown in weakness, raised in power, he grew. On up from the grave, his people to save. Every side, traded for songs to celebrate. Death overturned, though we cried, tears won't remain. We will all be changed on the day. up anew, no labor in pain, our King won't delay, the heavens open wide, His voice running through, like waters of light, I am coming soon, every sign, training for songs to celebrate, death overturned, though we cry, tears won't remain. breath back. Our benediction today comes from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.
So go this week remembering Jesus is coming back. And until he dies, we are here as his ambassadors, sharing the good news that is for all people. So let's tell those around us who can provide for their needs and of the hope that can be found in Jesus. New City Church, you were sent.